In this video, we are going to explore bimolecular alcohol condensation as an alternative to the Williamson ether synthesis for creating ether products. In any condensation reaction, what we mean when we say condensation is we are referring to a reaction where we are joining two molecules together generally with the loss of a small molecule such as water during the reaction. So by condense, it means we're linking two molecules together. So by condensation, the definition here is that we're joining two molecules together by a covalent bond, usually accompanied by the loss of some small molecule, such as water. So how do we apply bimolecular alcohol condensation in order to yield ether products? The way that this will work is we set it up so that we have two identical alcohol molecules, which I will call ROH. We place those into an acidic environment. Usually the acid here is sulfuric acid, H2SO4, but you may also see it just written as H3O plus or H plus as a shorthand way of doing it. And what happens is that keep in mind the term condensation, bimolecular, bimolecular meaning that two are coming together. We have our two alcohol molecules come together and they will form a link via the oxygen atom to give a symmetrical ether product. This reaction really only works well in yielding a reasonable amount of product if our alcohols that are reacting are identical, meaning that if we have a container that just has one particular alcohol molecule in it, the ether synthesis may proceed. If it is multiple alcohols, such as methanol mixed with ethanol, then you would get a mixture of different symmetrical and asymmetrical ether products. So as a result, to control and steer this reaction toward a single product in high yield, we have just one particular alcohol structure here react it with acid, condensing those two alcohol molecules together in this acid catalyzed fashion to yield a symmetrical ether product. Now, there are some additional restrictions to this reaction in addition to it being suitable really for only for yielding symmetrical ethers. Another limitation is that it will only work well with a primary alcohol that is not stearically hindered. The less steric hindrance, the better. As steric hindrance increases, what happens is that rather than the reaction being bimolecular where it's favorable for two alcohol molecules to join together, instead, the reaction that's favored becomes an acid catalyzed dehydration reaction that yields a product that has a carbon-carbon double bond. Because what we learned um, back in organic one is that if you have an alcohol molecule reacted with acid, you can get acid catalyzed dehydration to give an alkene product. And that's what will happen if there's steric hindrance going on. But if you have a primary carbon with very little steric hindrance, you can get a high yield of symmetrical ether. So this reaction is commonly carried out with such things as dimethyl ether, as the common name of a structure that ha is an, uh, creating an ether that has methyl groups on both sides. Diethyl ether is another product that can be created with this reaction. But when you get into more complex ether molecules that have branched R groups and steric hindrance, um, things become a lot more dicey. So let's walk through the mechanism for how in the world does this reaction take place to condense two non sterically hindered alcohol molecules together to give a symmetrical ether product. We will do our example reaction and mechanism here for taking two ethanol molecules, CH3, CH2, OH, reacted with sulfuric acid as our catalyst, H2SO4, to give us one diethyl ether product out of this. Diethyl ether, when drawn out, always looks like, as an aside, some sort of bird or something to me, where this is the head of the bird and the wings. Um, so. Looking at the structure of this product relative to the reactant and trying to sort out how this reaction takes place, whenever we have an acid present in a reaction mixture, it is a safe assumption 
that that acid being that it's very reactive is going to act in the very first step of the reaction mechanism. So the first step is protonation because relative to the organic molecule, a proton is being picked up. So our organic molecule, in this case, ethanol, we'll just take one of those ethanol molecules. When it is placed into that acidic solution of H2SO4, it's going to pick up a proton. I'm going to abbreviate that as just H plus rather than drawing out the full Lewis structure for sulfuric acid, which is not really the point here. So we're just trying to illustrate that the oxygen is acting as a base to pick up a proton from our sulfuric acid in this acid base protonation reaction. And you can make that safe assumption anytime you have a relatively strong acid in your reaction mixture that what will happen first is that a lone pair of electrons of the organic molecule or a pi bond will pick up a proton. And here in the alcohol, what we have available to pick up a proton is the oxygen with the oxygen lone pair. So that's what's going to pick up the proton here to give our alkyl oxonium intermediate. So we have our oxygen there directly bonded now to two hydrogens here and here. So I'll put OH2. We still have one set of lone pair electrons there. So I'll plug that in and now it's gonna have a positive formal charge. And now that we have done that protonation with our acid catalyst, we have set up an alcohol, protonated alcohol molecule so that now this carbon right here that I'm highlighting, that's directly bonded to the H2O, is very electrophilic because it's bonded to a positively charged oxygen. This positively charged oxygen is very, very electron deficient, and so it is pulling electron density toward itself very, very strongly. And that is hence pulling electron density away from this carbon, making the carbon very electron deficient and highly electrophilic. And so this carbon now is a very strong, capable electrophile, much more so than initially prior to picking up that proton. And this is how the reaction is catalyzed by acid, is that the acid protonates that oxygen to create a much more electrophilic carbon atom here. And moreover, now that the oxygen has picked up an extra proton, we have H2O here, water, which is a very good leaving group because if we break that away, our product of breaking that away would be water, which is highly stable. So second step of the reaction mechanism is now going to be an SN2 type reaction step where an alcohol molecule that is the second ethanol molecule is going to come in, act as a nucleophile to attack the alkyl oxonium. The oxonium term there just means an oxygen that has a positive charge on it. So what we will show here is that we bring in our second alcohol molecule. It reacts with our alkyl oxonium electrophilic carbon that we generated as a result of that protonation stop. And so we can show what's happening here by taking our Lone pair of electrons from the oxygen of our alcohol acts as our nucleophile. Our electrophile is over here. So we get some SN2 going on because we have the nucleophilic attack occurring at the same time the leaving group leaves. And this is why the reaction can only occur at a non-sterically hindered carbon atom is because for this SN2 reaction to take place here, for this carbon that I'm circling with my laser pointer to be effectively attacked, by the nucleophile, it has to be non-sterically hindered. If it's sterically hindered, then we would start getting an elimination reaction going on instead, rather than this nucleophilic substitution. A nucleophilic substitution is what will yield our ether product that we're aiming for here. So now with this going on, we've got our oxygen atom. And that oxygen atom is from over here. So the oxygen had a two carbon chain associated with it. That's the two carbon chain here. Oxygen came over, formed a covalent bond to the alkyl oxonium as the leaving group water left. So I'll go ahead and draw that in by putting a blue line here to indicate the new covalent bond. And then coming on to give the other carbon of the chain like so. And then we do need to remember that the hydrogen atom 
that we had right here, circled in pink in our reactants, is still hanging out there. So I'm going to put that into my product here, like so. That's going to cause there to be a positive formal charge on the oxygen. That's reasonable because the net charge has to be conserved between reactant and product at each step. So here the reactant, which I'm circling, in total they have a net charge of plus one. So therefore the product side of this equation has to have a net charge of plus one as well. And that plus one is going to reside on the oxygen. The other product of this particular step would be water released by breaking that carbon oxygen bond here of the alkyl oxonium reactant. So that's going to give us this as our product of this step. And then finally, as the grand finale to this mechanism, now we just need to deprotonate. Protons are very easily gained and lost from organic molecules, particularly when they're bonded to electronegative atoms. And so we can bring in a very weak base to remove this proton from our acid. And so we'll refer to that here as step three. I'm just going to try to zoom out a little bit to squeeze in step three on this same slide page. So it's step three. We call it deprotonation. This is also going to allow us to recognize why the acid is acting as a catalyst in this reaction. It's a catalyst because it's consumed at an early step of the reaction. That was the protonation step used up the acid. Now the deprotonation step, we're recreating the acid. So there's no net change in the amount of acid present in the reaction flask from the beginning of the reaction to the end of the reaction. So I'm just drawing back out my intermediate here that we need to deprotonate. So put my positive formal charge on there. And for the base that you are going to use to deprotonate the acid, you could use either the water that you've just created here, or you could use another unit of the methan of the ethanol reactant that can act as a, as a base as well. So I'm just gonna put this in as ROH, indicating this could be an alcohol or it could be water, it doesn't matter which. And we'll bring in the lone pair electrons from that acting as a base. Therefore, by definition, a base grabs a proton like so, breaking that hydrogen oxygen bond and the electrons from that bond go down onto the oxygen so that you create as your product of this reaction, the diethyl ether. So we'll go ahead and circle that final organic product out of this reaction keeping in mind throughout here that this reaction and the mechanism that we've just walked through really only works if you have primary alcohols, two primary alcohols that are non-sterically hindered reacting. If they're steric hindrance, then what will happen after the protonation step is that instead of getting this SN2 going on, you will rather get elimination going on to give an alkene product following Zaitsev's rule using just one of the alcohol molecules. What we've done here is really added a second method for synthesizing ethers to our toolkit of methods for making ether molecules. So this tags on from the Williamson ether synthesis that we learned about in the last video.